and welcome back everyone to part one uh, gold as the center of the financial solar system so with this uh, we all know gold's been around forever um, what you can make the argument of is that gold has evolved to be the best form of money um, you know think about 10,000 8,000 years ago people were probably bartering wheat for potatoes and chickens for this and that and we all know that barter is a very inefficient way of exchanging goods and services uh, that being said is that gold ha has been money and has had utility uh, it's very convertible to jewelry to store and also you can I, I believe <laughs> You can take a look back in history, but it's possible tribal leaders, kings, uh, would display this jewelry, which also helped uh, demonstrate wealth, attract mates, uh, also helps you provide security. Um, also with this in 1971 is the big deal as we went off the gold standard. This made the currency inherently worthless and was no longer a receipt for gold. Um, we can then observe issues with putting value valuing items in fiat but that problem does not exist with gold and i'm going to go through a bunch of charts you're going to see below that one of the things i discussed in the uh in the intro here was that you can look back in history and gold has relative value to other things now at times those relationships get strained up or down sideways but um if a currency would collapse, one of the first things that you would look to do is to revalue everything in gold and then probably your commodities. Uh, and then from there, you can start to price your goods and services from there. Now, I love this this graph. I, I've used this now in blogs and, and Twitter posts. Uh, but um, this is one of the things I, I was thinking about. I had to look this up then when uh, this this hit my brain because I remember seeing stuff about geocentric orbits uh, years ago watching a science channel where I, I, I was considering the concept of where fiat currency is the geocentric model where things just don't look right. If everyone's supposed to be revolving around the earth, look how screwed up all these orbits get. So my thinking was that gold was more of like the heliocentric model where everything more or less revolved around it. And like I said, everything then gets priced off of gold. So if you have a fiat currency, it has no intrinsic value. It's a piece of paper. So how do you value that piece of paper against a hundred pounds of copper? It's not really possible. You have to look at, you know, is, hundred dollars worth one ounce of gold and then how much is copper worth from there so you have to price everything in gold first and that's the problem that i think everyone's running into right now and have been for the last 50 years is when you force feed this fiat system as the center you all these problems start to occur so let's go through a couple more of these slides um what i noticed uh in mike maloney's uh wealth cycles he, he kind of used the the sine wave to show uh, relative values to each other. Now, he was looking at buying high and selling low when it comes to real estate versus the Dow versus gold, all that kind of stuff. But what I was seeing was energy being released. I'll get into more of that later. But what this can also show is economic cycles. Uh, when you're pulling oil out of the ground, um, maybe Maybe it's $60 a barrel and over the course of time the price starts to go up and more people get involved in, in, in the oil industry and then you produce more oil and the supply becomes plentiful and you start to see price fall. That's, the, that's, that's economic cycles, uh, that's market cycles of, of any kind of product or, or industry. Um, so sine, wave, sine waves also appear in the release of physical energy and I'll get into more of that later. But this is a, a cool graphic I'd seen. This actually deals with cosine wave, but um, it, it can show you about how things uh, revolve around the sun and how this, uh, like the earth is revolving around the sun and, and it creates these fun looking sine waves. So um, these are the types of things that evolve in nature. Um, so I just mentioned the, 
the business cycle of oil versus gold. Now, if you're pricing oil in grams of gold, um, you'll see in some of the charts, uh, like up, I'll, I'll show you this one here, where I, I've used this one several times before as well. If you look back, I don't know, 50 years, 40, 50 years, you can see how oil and gold have relative values to each other. Sometimes the price is higher, sometimes it's lower, and when that price is much lower, maybe you trade in some gold to buy oil, and maybe when the price is higher, you trade in oil to buy gold. So there is a relationship between the two of these that is pretty much obvious to the eyes. Now, you can also make the argument that when the price of oil goes up, it's more expensive to mine gold, and maybe less gold is mined, and it makes it, makes it more scarce. So the supply and demand of these things go both ways. It's not just the oil with this, but the gold only uh, only increases a, a very small portion each year. I think it's like 1.25%, whatever the rate of population growth is. So uh, if you look at the, the business cycle of oil, you can see it becomes more expensive. More people get into the industry, uh, more supply is created and it starts to drive price down. Um, and then you, you see it starts to do the mean reversion. Um, oil starts to become cheaper and supplies and supplies reduce companies start leaving the market at the lower ends here and when companies start leaving the leaving the markets obviously supply becomes constrained and there's less of it and then becomes more scarce and the price goes up and you you can see how this works when you're valuing it in grams of gold now this is oil in us dollars over the course of the last 70 years or so and look how schizophrenic this chart is there is no relative value in fiat here um, you can see the high end of this you're looking at 160 dollars a barrel the low end last year oil had what negative 37 per barrel um, anyway in the fiat dollars you can see there's there's big busts and booms with this now once again we we talk about the, the sine wave, um, and this is this appears with gold's relationship to pretty much everything, copper, aluminum, timber, lumber, all of these things, they, it goes back and forth and back and forth and ebbs and flows and ebbs and flows for thousands of years. Now, I also don't have access to the research of products going back three or four or 500 years, and I'm sure there's probably a PhD out there that has priced everything in gold going back many years and gold relative to other things. So if anybody's got that information, I, I know that somebody had given me a website where things were priced in gold. Um, I, I completely misplaced it, but um, what I would like to do is kind of take a look at that relationship. Um, I did some research on my own. Uh, I think it was MarketWatch or whatever did give you some free data. And I found that you can see on the top left here, I think, I, what is that uh, gold versus uh, silver um, I think the next one is the, the third one over is gold versus copper so you can see these things all have relative values in it and I think the last one there may be that might be uh, the Dow so you can see sometimes things go very low versus gold or very high versus gold and there's times to get in and out of gold and then you can price the Dow versus real estate and all that other fun stuff but the concept here is if gold is the center of your financial universe, all things are priced in gold relatively, and then your fiat, in in a sense, should be backed off. It should be valued in your in your gold. So, what you what you're able to do is you're able to observe that relationship with most things. Um, there's a high correlation with silver. Uh, you might see gold go up, and then six months later, eight months later, gold. Uh, silver then starts following. Uh, it moves further and faster when it follows. So it's not the same correlation at the time. So it might skew the charts a little bit, but there are relationships between gold and other things. I just heard this awesome video yesterday about apparently how uh, lumber and gold have a relationship there where if the lumber value crashes, um, that can potentially signal uh, a, a, Dow, a Dow crash as well. It, it creates conditions which the Dow could crash from it. Um, one of the other things I'd like to talk about, yes, gold and silver have a, a high correlation and were part of the bimetallic standard. But this is the big concept I'd like to talk about was 
yeah, if you had two silver dimes in 1964, you could buy a gallon of gas. And if you take those two silver dimes that are dated 1964, and today you take them to a coin shop, you could buy a gallon of gas today with that. So that that, that those pieces of silver are relative to the price of gas 50 years later. Um, and this is something that'll bend a lot of people's noodles, bake their noodles. It'll really screw them up if you really think about it. Now, there is a, a price difference, perhaps 10 or 20 or 30 percent that, that it would fluctuate, but it's in the general ballpark. Whereas if you looked at the price of gas in, in US dollars in 1964, maybe it was 20 cents. And if you looked at it in US dollars today for a gallon, you're looking at somewhere around $3, 320 depending on what state you're in. So you can make the argument that the price of gas is 15, 20 times higher now in US dollars. But it's not actually that gas is more expensive, it's that the US dollar lost all of its value. I'm gonna show that in a couple slides here too. So also with gold and silver, you have controlled production. You can't just flip a switch and double your gold supply in a year. It just doesn't work like that. Most people that are dealing with the economic systems here, they don't understand it could take 10 or 15 years to get a gold or a silver mine online. Um, and, and during those, those periods of scarcity, you can have much higher values in gold and silver, which then also can curtail production of other things. And this is a, this is what I would like to talk about later is like, these things are all kind of self-regulated systems. So, uh, and that's, that's where I was getting at the production of the resources, the growth was limited by the money supply of gold. So if you find this awesome copper mine and you just start producing copper out the wazoo and people are paying you fiat dollars for it, and there's this supply here, you can just keep producing gold and, and make more money and make more money. But if you're if you were constrained with your your budgets and, and you could only buy with the amount of gold that you have in theory, and there's only so much gold to go around, your copper price starts to go up so high that you don't want to exchange your gold for for copper. And then therefore, what happens is there's less copper, there's less copper sold, or or more people get into the copper business, and there's such a supply glut that you know the price of copper you know crashes and then you don't want to make copper anymore so they have these self-regulated systems uh, and when you start introducing fiat currency you break the whole thing conclusion here gold is the heliocentric model and and all stores of financial and energy oscillate to gold it is nature's money as robert kiyosaki calls it he calls it god's money it's evolved as the best store of wealth over 5,000 years. I know they, they have some potential competitors today, and I'll get into, I don't know, the part five, why I don't think that's really a good comparison. Um, but the, the metal had evolved because it was, it was durable, it was very malleable, and it was also rust proof. I, I know silver has some tarnishing issues, but um, generally speaking, gold has been the best form of money. Um, it also has the fixed supply, uh, digging it out of the ground has a financial cost, which then has an ROI. Like I mentioned, whether it was a hundred joules of energy, financial energy needed, or a hundred dollars or whatever it is, you're not digging it out of the ground unless you're getting more back out of it than you put into it. So this also restricts the money supply, because if you get to a point in time where gold is somewhat plentiful, uh, and then the price drops, then you're not mining it. And then eventually population increase, um, demand will pick up and then mining will resume again. Other commodities that are money are extracted at a rate relevant to gold. And in, in another chart here, I'm going to, I'm going to talk in another part, I'm going to talk about how I felt that gold and silver and copper and pork and and beef, all of this stuff 10,000 years ago was money. So today, I you hear Mike Maloney's video and he starts talking about words like fungible and divisible. And I, I would contend that that is the best form of money, but it's not the definition of money. And again, here's me just doing my own thing. But 10,000 years ago, if you had 100 chickens, you could essentially sell that for... 10 cows or whatever it was. It was money. It was not efficient money, but it was money. So a lot of the things under the commodities umbrella 
I generally put into the money store class, which again I'll talk about in another in another slide. And and why do I call it money? Because it has the intrinsic value. And and with that, all of those monies were self-regulated to each other. So too many cows, all of a sudden the price goes down. You don't so um anyway I'm gonna leave this one off here. I got a I got a bunch of more uh bunch of more parts here to add so I'm, I'm just gonna leave this so